So there's a new feature in Equalizer, which is the LSF solver. So that means least square fits, and this is an old-fashioned brute force solver. So let's look at four different examples about how this old-fashioned survey solver can be used. So we've got a shot right here. So what we're going to do is, you know, it won't be very useful, this example. What we're going to do is we're going to take these out of survey. We're going to do a one-point solve on that particular point on the blaster. And then we're going to take the rotations, the uh, rotations for the blaster, and we're going to lock them off. And then when we go to the survey solver here, what we're going to do is that the rotations we're going to lock off because they're going to be locked to the dynamic curve in the curve editor. And then there's various options here. We're just going to use the single survey point here. We calculate it for the range. And then we use the result. So we can see that everything's locked in a one point solve to this here. Now we can have as many points as we want, but if you do a one point solve, then you're going to, um, you know, you're limited, you know, usually just to two. You know, translation or rotation. Let's try this again. Actually, this one here should probably just be um, uh, locked to a static value is there as well. Let's try that. Or actually, to the um, this one here, we would probably lock. I'll probably jump a little bit, but let's try it. So there's many esoteric ways that this can be used. Let's examine what happens if some of these points are not uh, fully surveyed points. So first of all, if you use this trick of having something partially surveyed on XYZ, the XY, the uh, LXS F solver will not uh, allow you to use this little trick. It has to be fully surveyed. So right here. This is our normal mode where it only uses survey points. Now, if you only have a single point like this, it's a one point solve, so you can only have a couple of channels uh, enabled for calculation. If not, it's uh, mathematically uh, sort of impossible. It's sort of ambiguous solve. So, right here, if we include uh, line of points, then you see that this line of point is now part of the solve, and a line of point is almost the exact same thing as a survey point. If we click disable points, then this disable point becomes part of the solve. Now, if we hit include survey free points, then all these points get involved. Now, if this survey free point does not have a calc on it, if there's no XYZ position that's previously been determined, then the solver will ignore it. In the next situation, is we're going to take the camera and we're going to lock off the RZ. It's very common in solves, especially when we want to have a couple points, to have a very noisy solve on the roll. So let's just get rid of these points here. So again, we're solving for the camera here. What we're going to do is that we're going to make it lock as nicely as possible. What we're going to do is everything's going to calculate except for this will be locked either to a static value or in this case we'll do it to uh, the curve editor. So we calculate it. And now we've got a locked solve except for the RZ is locked off. Now what we could do is we could potentially take a point that's on screen the entire time let's say this one here, and give it a very high weight. This is a common strategy in LSF solving. So we go here. Also notice there's a single frame, but this particular one will use the frame range for the calc part. So let's calc this again. Use the result. So notice the RZ is locked off, but everything is locked to that particular point that we had for our survey. 
So the next situation is this for facial track. So this has been tracked incorrectly because there's no tracking points on the ears. So of course it's going to be noisy. So what we're going to do is that when you track a camera, we know that you smooth the translations and then it recalcs to make the rotations consistent. But when you track an object, usually it's the reverse. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the rotations for this head and we're going to smooth them a lot. Let's move this here. Do it for the next curve. And for our third curve, we're going to filter this again. So what we want to do is that we want to recalculate the translations to lock. We're going to give this a high weight. Typically you want the nose to lock the best. And so now we'll do a least square fix solve. So the rotations are going to lock to what's in the curve. And that's going to recalculate the translations to match. So let's check this out. So this is a very imperfect result, but it's illustrating the principle that we smoothed the rotations and then resolved for the translations. The final example here is we have a series of lens grids. We don't know what the focal lengths are. We know because they weren't slated properly. So it's a zoom lens. So this is a 15 to 40 millimeter lens. And we know the last one's 40. We know the first one's 15. We want to figure out what the in-between focal lengths are. So each one gets its own lens. So this first one here, what we do is that we've got four points here. And they're the same four points in all the different shots. Now there's another way of doing this, which is there's a get FOV command here. I'm sorry, not get FOV. Uh, there's a um, um, get 2D point position here where it'll just uh, show where points are. But we're not going to use that for this particular one. We're going to do the, yeah, this is normalized. So one would be the right hand side, zero would be the left hand side. So we're looking at the X, this is uh, 0.38. And then we could get this point right here, get the points. And then you could subtract this from this, and then you would know the distance. And then when you went to the next frame, you could do it again. And then you could divide the two uh, different distances between these two points here. And you could calculate focal length that way. But that's a, little, a lot of handwork. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this first frame here, and we're going to solve it nodal. Okay, so everything's at the origin here. And so now we've got these four points and we've got a camera at the origin and we've got a focal length of 15. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this and we're gonna convert to survey. So now it doesn't matter how we calculate this. Let's say we do this here. It's still gonna be the same position, it's still gonna be 15 millimeters. So let's go to our other cameras. Go this one here, but we're going to use the survey solver. So the positions are locked to static value, which is zero, because we just want the camera to be at the origin. So we calc right here. Okay, and notice that it's figured out that's 17.45 millimeter lens. Why? Because we've got convert to survey on these points and all that's happening is it's zooming. So now let's go to the next point. Do the same thing. Okay. 
Okay. Now let's try it again and see whether calc single frame will work. Yes, it did. And it's calculating the focal length as well. Again, for this next one, let's look at the window. So it's keeping the camera at zero in each one of these. It's recalculating the rotations, but most importantly, it's recalculating the focal length. And so if we look right here, most of these cameras are all at the same origin, but they've got different fields of view. So let's continue. And these other options can be useful at times. Okay, so the camera's been solved. 36, and then we'll go to our final one. 40. So now we figured out the in-between focal lengths for this, and so if we're going to build up a lens table, we've got a better basis to work on here because we know the nominal focal length uh, because the zoom lens, um, they didn't slate or write down the markings for the in-between lengths.